Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for our 14th annual Animal Survivor. We're really excited to be here. On behalf of the ACVIM Marketing and Communications Committee, our Board of Regents, our sponsors, Zoetis, Healthy Paws, and Hills, and, uh, and our folks up front here, I want to welcome everybody to Animal Survivor. I'm your host, Dr. Sandy Willis. I'm a board-certified small animal internal medicine specialist with the ACVIM. I'm an internal medicine consultant, work full-time for Phoenix Central Lab. We're a small diagnostic lab, just a little north of here, Muckleteal. And I am on the ACVIM Foundation Development Committee and a former past president or past chair of the ACVIM Marketing Communications Committee. And I've been an MC with Animal Survivor a long period of time. You guys are really in for a treat today. The American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine is a certifying body for veterinary specialists in small and large animal medicine, cardiology, oncology, and neurologist, neurology. We have almost over 2,000 diplomats board certified veterinary specialists and we serve a variety of patients. We're gonna be talking today about horses and dogs. We serve cats and cattle. And we really are partners in kind of a triangle of care with the private veterinarian, the primary care physician. So with, between the primary care physician and all of these wonderful survivors were referred by their, their primary care veterinarians to the specialist with the specialist and the pet owner. We work together for for the pets, and it's all about doing the best we can for the pets. Um, the ACVIM Forum, of which you guys are attending here in Seattle for the third time, is really a premier continuing education event for internal medicine. We have specialists here, we have general veterinarians, private practitioners, we have technicians and students. The forum is about sharing the latest and greatest in knowledge, sharing ideas, debating things, getting new research ideas, and all with a focus on these guys, the pets, because that's what we're taking the knowledge that we're sharing here and bringing it back to the community. And I'm really excited in the, oh, 19 years I've been in this community, the growth of specialty medicine here. And I'm really proud of both the primary care physicians in my community and my colleagues in specialty medicine and in specialty dermatology, ophthalmology, all kinds of other specialties, what we can offer the pet here, pets here. And I'm most and all awe of the pet owners here. As a pet owner myself of a cat that went to a specialist three months ago to have some specialty work done because it's not what I do, um, now I have a cat that does not have cancers, in fact had just inflammation of his larynx, who would have thought, but being a veterinarian that's what happens to our pets, and is doing very well in prednisone. So we also are pet owners and really appreciate the advances in medicine like internal medicine to benefit the pets. I will point out that we at the ACVIM are, have a couple of wonderful websites. Our ACVIM.org new, is new and it has a great place for pet owners to find specialists in their community. It does work best for pet owners to work with their primary care physicians to see veterinarians because that teamwork is hugely important. The records we get from the, the primary care physician and the aftercare that goes back to that veterinarian, but pet owners, if they do want to seek referral on their own, can find a specialist through acvm.org and, and either talk to their veterinarian about referring that idea or contact the specialist. We also, I want to also mention, we have a very um, exciting giving body, uh, our ACVIM Foundation, acvmfoundation.org. And what I like most about it, and I've given to the foundation on behalf of my pet, is if your pet has benefited from some of the advances in medicine, it's a great place to give back to the ACVIM. The foundation creates grants to help more research go further. And so to, if a pet has died of cancer, a typical type of cancer potentially that we don't have all the answers for, the ACVIM Foundation is a way to give more money to advance research in that area. But when we started the Animal Survivor years ago, the um, ACVM is also involved in, in promoting specialty medicine. And how could we best do this? We started out with Pet Survivor, now Animal Survivor, where specialists started talking about the cases that they saw. And about five years ago, we thought, well, who best to tell the story of the visit to the primary care physician, of the hearing of a potentially very devastating diagnosis, 
of the kind of relief of seeing a specialist and hearing that, boy, maybe there's something we can do to treat and with the expertise of that specialist, um, then the pet owner themselves, and then who best to really tell the story of quality of life through all of that, because we hear all the time, why would you put your pet through that, are the pets. Dr. Chelsea Tripp in her video, we have fine, five fine videos to show you, uh, mentions, she's an oncologist in our area, mentions go out to my rating, waiting room at AMC up there in uh, Shoreline, and she tells pet owners that, go out to the waiting room and see which animals you think are on chemotherapy. It's really hard to tell. And as you guys see these, um, these animal survivor stories, really note the bond that these folks have, that they are really like t Team Gomez says, they're really a, a, um, a team around their pets, and um, see how happy these pets are and the quality of life that they have. And that is just really important story. So I want to introduce a few folks, and then what we're going to do is I'm going to stop talking and let the stories tell themselves. So we have Nicole Kilgos and her husband, Jeff Rose Kelly, and Baxter, who is right over here. Baxter, the happy doggy. Um, and then we have Dr. Alex Partnow, VCA Veterinary Specialty Center of Seattle in Linwood, and she's in the back. And I'm going to invite her or the specialist to come up with each video to talk a little bit about them. We got Team Lucy Gomez, Lori Massey Gomez, and Manuel Gomez, and Lucy with her squeaky toy. And her veterinarian specialist was Dr. Kelly McCorb of Summit Veterinary Referral Center. They're down in Tacoma, a little bit south of us. We have Betsy and George Piano and Obi, the golden retriever over there. And her onco Obi's oncologist, Dr. Chelsea Tripp of AMC of Seattle up in Shoreline. She'll be up front a little bit later. Then we have Kat and Mate Tiley. They were Jackson's owners. And they're behind me right here. I'm really excited to see them. And they also work with Dr. Chelsea Tripp. Um, in years past, we've had, we have brought the horses in. We always love a large animal um, case. It's, it's really exciting to have Dr. Chantel Rothschild and Julie Blackbow here, who's going to talk about Q, an amazing Rocky Mountain spotted horse. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted, Rocky Mounted horse. <laughs> We're really excited. One year, we did have a horse with gastrointestinal upset come into the forum and was with his pony. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything was fine. We didn't have to clean up anything. But, yeah. <laughs> but we're really excited to present our first video this morning, and this is going to be on Baxter. Baxter's story is presented by Hills and Healthy Paws. And then I will introduce Baxter's owners and Dr. Partnow to come up front and talk a little bit about Baxter. I'm Jeff, and this is my wife, Nicole, and uh, this is our dog, Baxter. He was always a really healthy dog, and uh, he was um, quite the athlete. We taught him how to catch frisbees, and so that was one of his favorite things to do, and he's, he's very fast and uh, a great leaper and very smart. We had no signs of anything healthy wrong. Dog. He had been a very, very healthy dog. We've got a huge flight of stairs, and so he'd come stairs. up the stairs in kind of an odd way, like he'd be dragging his feet a little bit. But it's just kind of the things you think like, oh, that's weird. Well, maybe he's just a little bit sore because we were playing today, or you know, we went for a long walk or something like that, so we just kind of brush it off a little bit. We were watching the neighbor's golden retriever, and I let them outside to play. So when they came in, he was laying down, and I asked him to stand up, and I noticed that he was having a difficult time getting up. And it was concerning. I wanted to see what was happening. I wanted to get more information. I wanted to um, see if he could do things that he typically does. And so I asked him to jump up on the bed, and he did. And he screamed. And then he laid on the bed, and he just cried and cried and cried. So when I first saw 
Baxter, he was still able to walk, no major gait deficits. On his exam, the main things that I noted were some loss of muscle mass in his back end, um, particularly for a young active dog, and also he did have significant pain in his lower back. And so then um, anesthetized him and performed an MRI, um, which is what actually led to the diagnosis of a nerve sheath tumor. Um, and what it is, is it's the nerve, if you think of it like electrical wiring, um, you've got the, the actual wire part would be what's called the axon, which transmits information. And then there's a myelin sheath around, which is like the insulation. And in a nerve sheath tumor, it's that insulating part that actually starts to grow out of control and strangulates down on the nerve. It was just, it was a shock to both of us. Yeah, it was devastating. The possibility of actually losing him and then the kind of prognosis that we got that it would be that he would be dying within months and that it would be an excruciatingly painful death for him was very, very yeah. difficult. It was heart-wrenching. With his initial visit, we diagnosed the fact that he had a nerve sheath tumor and then based on the ultrasound and the endoscopy and said he has mild inflammatory bowel disease. So the initial treatment that we kind of sent him on was using a diet so he was on Hill's ID and that helped control the diarrhea and then also we put him on a combination of pain medications and anti-inflammatories which initially were keeping his pain fairly well controlled and he was able to be a bit more active. The ID stands for intestinal diet and it's made so it's very easily digestible. Um, and so in dogs that have vomiting and have diarrhea, it's a very nice option for something that can calm down their intestinal tract. It really helped, it really helped him. It was a very gentle food um, and it made giving his medications to him. I mean, we were giving him so many medications, six times a day medications. The food that we were giving him was, was perfect. perfect. Yeah. It made it so much easier. Within a couple of months of his diagnosis, really, the ongoing persistent problem was his back pain related to the tumor that we'd seen on the MRI. And so based on the MRI, the tumor itself wasn't accessible through traditional surgery in that we would have had to go in, amputate his leg, and still be thinking that we probably didn't get the whole tumor out. In talking to the owners, we decided that radiation treatment would be the ideal option in terms of something that would be less invasive, but also probably give him a better quality of life quite quickly. And I went Google crazy. And finally, I stumbled on this article by a doctor out of New York about cyber knife treatment. My understanding is that it's so precise that they can do the typical 18 or 19 doses, whatever is typical for radiation, in one to three treatments. Because it's so precise, um, they're not as worried about the healthy tissue surrounding the tumor. Mm -hmm. So you can do the same high intensity in much shorter duration. It really was remarkable. I mean, almost instantly we could tell the difference. It was I mean, fast. Like, was it like that less than a week, week he was coming up the stairs that by himself? That first week. And like, Within a month of having the treatment, we were able to taper him off of his medications. And since his treatment, he's actually now been completely off all of his medications. He's back to playing, going on hikes. His quality of life right now is really where it had been before he started to show any of these signs. A friend of ours had recommended that we get health insurance. That was a huge huge part of his story and his outcome. Healthy Paws really came through for us. Healthy Paws was amazing. They were as big as anything else and how they supported us. Everybody kind of came through and everything fell into place perfectly for, for Baxter. I was really blown away at the sophistication of care for animals um, and going to California to get the cyber knife treatment that he got um, was yet another experience of that. The people that were in Baxter's life as part of that treatment team to help him with his cancer, they were incredibly compassionate, you know, very, very good with Baxter, but also really with great us. with us too. Yeah, so with us. We're just very impressed. We'll always be grateful for that. And I have our undying gratitude for 
for what they were able to do for him. Want to come up here? And Dr. Sure. Partnow, do you want to come up, please? And um, do we? Uh, do you want to tell a little bit more, or is there something you want to share? Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Well, first of all, you should probably know that both my wife and I are pretty sleep deprived right now, so our dog's <laughs> going to probably come across as looking much more intelligent than we will. <laughs> but if anybody has any questions, how, how old is Baxter at this point? He's a rescue, so we're not exactly sure, but we're guessing eight-ish, eight to nine. Dr. Partnow, did, what, will, is this something that'll, this um, sheath tumor, is it something that'll grow back, or what's the long-term prognosis? Yeah, and so with nerve sheath tumors, right now the cyber knife treatment that he got would still be in the cage of experimental treatments. We know a little bit more about how the tumors respond to traditional radiation. And so usually with that, what happens is that the radiation will stop the tumor growth and shrink it, but we worry about recurrence locally. The hope is that with the cyber knife, because like Nicole said in the video, he was able to get such a high dose sparing the normal tissues around that potentially instead of just stalling things, we've actually obliterated the tumor. That's something that just time will tell. So at this point, we've been just kind of checking up on him every three months or so. And, and so far, he, every time he comes in, he's still doing really well, still off all of his medications. It's been about a year and a month mm -hmm. since he's he completed the treatment, and we haven't seen any signs of any reoccurrence. So He's lost just a hair of function, not much. He can't run as fast as he used to, and we um, we are care we don't know if he has pain anymore uh, so we're careful about certain things uh, we're not really playing frisbee as much with him the really high intensity stuff we've backed up backed off on and we might do some of these things in a graded and very um, well monitored fashion how, when he plays intensely with other dogs He's got a lot of, uh, a lot of m my attention. Do <laughs> 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 yeah. um, you have an idea of the cost if you hadn't had insurance? Uh, uh, we have a general idea. Um, it was 11000 for the, the cyber, for the knife, cyber alone knife alone. It was $11,000. And without including the travel costs and the hotels and um, all of the expenses related to getting him my time off work for two weeks to drive him to California and back. Um, I think just his treatment alone was around twenty thousand um, dollars, which Healthy Paws was so yeah, fantastic so supportive with. I, I'm I'm so grateful to a friend of ours in Salt Lake City who years ago said you guys really need to get health insurance before anything goes wrong and I put it on the back burner for um, a couple of years and I'm so I'm, I'm grateful that we got it in when we did and that the health insurance provider that we chose was stellar and not only in paying for everything but in they just they cared it was such a different experience than what we experienced with our health insurance. Right, yeah. So <laughs> that's kind of been our joke that his health insurance is so much better than our health insurance. And we're yeah. kind of thinking that maybe we'd ask Healthy Paws to cover the whole family. So. <laughs> and the level of care we got from beginning to end, starting, you know, not only, I don't want to just highlight Healthy Paws, they were as big of a part of a story as everything else, but from beginning to end, from our, what I'm referring to as our general practitioner vet. In our in Bellingham, um, to his specialty vets here in the Lin, in Linwood, and then in California, everyone was just really um, just so amazing, really, really amazing. Yeah. 
could you detail to us what you went through in California and how did, how did that? Sure. Did you drive from here to California, then what happens when you're there? Sure. So um, I, I took several days to drive um, for his comfort. And when I got there, uh, I rented a uh, apartment for two weeks. And as we had to do at home, this we had 20 stairs at our home, and the apartment had 20 stairs. So every time, it, but it was in the right price range. <laughs> and every time we, I had to take him in or out, we had to, um, just like at at home, I say we, but in California it was just me, try to stabilize his back going up and down the stairs so that there was as little movement as possible in the lower part of the spine where the um, joints are quite mobile so that he would be experiencing as little pain as possible. <laughs> Dogs have okay. a different agenda. Sit please, thank you, stay. And so um, when we first got there, we had a, an MRI, MRI? A CT scan. A CT scan, yeah. thank you. It was, it was, uh, it was, you can speak more yeah, to this, it was so something they couldn't do locally. Yeah, the, so basically there was a couple of months between the time of the initial diagnosis and going down to California. So standardly for radiation, whether it's cyber knife or whether it's what's called fractionated radiation, basically right before they're going to start treatment, they will do a CT scan, which helps them calibrate their machine. And so they like to do that. And then really it takes, once they get that image, it takes a couple of days for them to do the processing to make the program for their machine to know where is it focusing the beams of radiation. So that's what the initial appointment would be, the CT scan. And then it takes a couple of days for them to get it set up. And then after they've got it set up, then that's when he starts going in for the treatments. So I would take him into uh, uh, the specialist there, and um, and they um, were so kind, and they packed him up in a van, and they drove him to a human clinic, and. Uh, they would bring him back a couple hours later. I would just go to the coffee shop or something, get a phone call. They'd bring him back and um, I would take him home. And we went through this process three times. There was one weekend involved. So they could have done it uh, three simultaneous days, but because of the, our timing, there was a weekend involved. So uh, there was a lot of waiting around <laughs> um, and just a uh, appointment for his CAT scan and then three appointments that were maybe, I don't remember even, maybe one to three or three to four hours long uh, for the treatment. And we, I waited 24 hours after the last treatment just to make sure he didn't have any unexpected things arise before I got in the car and drove back and took several days to drive back. It was actually quite simple once we got there and just a lot of waiting. What, what city was that at? Carlsbad. And, and we'll, uh, the, the, the wonderful owners and their pets will be available for questions afterwards. I hope all of you guys can stay a little bit, but thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming up. Gosh, this story, and I really appreciate everybody being out here. Um, next, we have Obi. We're going to talk about Obi. Obi is um, Animal Survivors, also sponsored by Hills, with uh, Betsy and George Piano over here. I'm Betsy Piano. This is my husband George and this is our dog Obi. He is just such a sweetheart. He is just full of life. He's just kind of a big lummoxy sweetheart. Obi loves to play with little kids, other dogs. He plays with toys. He has a pile of toys over there. So he is just probably the most playful dog we've ever had. We had been out of town and he stayed with a friend of ours who has four Goldens. So it's just kind of, you know, golden WrestleMania. He jumped in my lap and his lip flopped up and I noticed a swelling on his gum above his canine on the left side. 
we thought, oh, he's been wrestling, playing tug of war and knocked a tooth loose and it's infected or something. And our regular vet said, oh, you know, he needs to go to a veterinary dental specialist. Well, I didn't know there was such a thing. She removed the tooth and tissue and sent it out and called us with a cancer diagnosis. So when I first saw him, the mass was quite small. It was about a one centimeter by uh, one and a half centimeter ulcerated proliferative tissue that had no pigment associated with it but obviously looked kind of raw and irregular. And the mass had been biopsied as a squamous cell carcinoma which is probably our second most common tumor we see in the mouth in dogs. This is a tumor that really likes to invade bone. He was a candidate for surgery because it was small. I really wanted to make sure the clients understood that he could have a very good prognosis and a good long-term survival if we were aggressive from the beginning. We were devastated. I mean, he's Absolutely certainly a part of the family and having lost our longtime golden just a couple of years before, uh, it was very difficult. We were very worried about it. It was so shocking to have a three-year-old dog diagnosed with cancer. You know, the thought of him losing up to a third of his upper jaw and you know losing the teeth and part of the roof of his mouth. I couldn't figure out how he'd ever be able to play or um, just really function normally. He did end up having two incisors on that side, the canine, and all the way back up to the premolar on that side removed. And so with resecting that bone and getting behind that tumor and we were able to take the teeth on either side, we could actually get a clean resection for him uh, so that this thing won't come back. Because Obi had had surgery to his mouth, we have to keep the foods very soft post-operatively. He really enjoyed Hill's ID, and so we stayed with that diet right after surgery. Hill's ID is a great gastrointestinal diet, and the stress of surgery, antibiotics after surgery, those all will have changes to the GI tract. And so trying to keep it bland and palatable and, and formable into meatballs for him, it makes it the perfect diet for him given the surgery he had. He loved it right from the beginning, and he did really, really well with it. He never missed a meal. <laughs> he never missed a <laughs> Obi did great with surgery. He really rebounded very quickly. He recovered beautifully. He has no idea he has cancer. He is living a normal life. He's about a year out from his original diagnosis at this point, and we hope he has many years to come. He does everything he's always done. He plays, he eats anything. He plays tug of war. There's no noticeable difference in his activity level she was whatsoever. On a, she was on a big old hunk of antler that is so hard. Yep, every I night, favorite can't toy. Can't imagine that he'd want to chew on that. The only noticeable sign of that surgery ever is that this lip will occasionally get caught on his tooth. I think he sailed through it. Yes. And so we are just so grateful. The, the clinic has done such a fantastic job. You know, we're just thrilled that we still have him. George and Obi. Hey, old man, you want to come up here? And Dr. Tripp. Just a couple of questions, but I think it's so important. It's, no one tells the story of the animals here, and this is a great opportunity for you folks to ask questions. And boy, it, when you think of people and cancer, it's just a way different thing with animals and cancer. Animals have, how many of you guys have anim, uh, pets out there? They have such a spirit. Come on, you guys. <laughs> I know we are just so thrilled that we found Dr. Tripp and the whole clinic down there, and we have been so impressed with the care down there. It's really true. If you sit in the waiting room down there, you know, everybody says, well, what's your dog in here for? And the owners are all so happy that their dogs are getting treatment, and the dogs are all still enjoying life, and... Uh, we're just amazed at how well he's done and how amazing the care has been. Um, he, he literally does everything he did before, and for having a big chunk of his jaw gone, we really thought, you know, I have a speech and hearing background, and I thought, oh, no, cleft palate, the water will come out his nose, food will come out, you know, how could he function? And he functions, you just really, people can't believe that he's had this surgery. It's amazing.
So we're really, really grateful. I think it's it's challenging uh, as owners of a younger dog as well to come up with a cancer diagnosis at the age of three. And I think sometimes it's not even on our radar at that timeline in their lifespan. So uh, to be aggressive, to get them to the places that can get them the answers uh, for these kinds of uh, problems and to have him have a normal lifespan now but uh, yet have cancer. So, yeah. Surgery was his entire treatment uh, because we caught it early. Uh, we would have had to look at radiation therapy and even some additional therapy if we had not gotten the clean margins that we did with his surgical resection. He's still on a monitoring program because I need to see him every three months just because I love him. <laughs> um, and ultimately, we'll keep really close tabs on his mouth for him. Uh, but uh, because we got the clean resection, he should do very well. I would like to add, when we first got the diagnosis from the um, dental specialist, oh, I'm sorry, from the dental specialist and realized that we had to have surgery, we looked all over Seattle and all the other clinics we contacted were telling us six to eight weeks to wait. And the dental um, specialist said that Obi couldn't wait that long. And we'd actually been to Dr. Tripp's clinic for another animal earlier. It never occurred to me they did this type of work. And when we called them, they had Obi in the next day to see him. And the surgery, I believe, was within a week. And I, I think that aggressiveness and that willingness to just respond to us is what actually saved Obi's life. Well, so, they got him in for the CAT scan. Yeah, we got a CT diagnose. scan very quickly on yeah. him and had him. And I have four surgeons in my building, which is really nice. So uh, we got him translated into getting care very quickly. And I'm going to add one more thing. I don't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> but the day we came in, Dr. Tripp had just been seriously injured in her clinic by another dog. And when we first met Dr. Tripp, she had just come from the hospital, was on pain medications, <laughs> and had just had serious stitches and came back to work to see Obi. And I was amazed. So we can't thank Dr. Tripp and their clinic enough. Oh, you're getting yourself all tied up, sir, here. There we go. All right, great. Thank you all very much. And, and OB was, again, sponsored by Hills Pet Nutrition. Um, it, it's great when a food is so easy to use and really clears up a, a, a GI upset. Um, Dr. Tripp, uh, and we'll talk about another patient of Dr. Tripp. She's at the Animal Medical Center up in, uh, in Seattle, up in Shoreline, a little bit north, north of us. We've been for, uh, blessed in the last few years to have multiple specialty practices move into our area, and it allows a great teamwork. And uh, as the pianos mentioned, I mean, this is what we're here today to do, to let people know that specialists are there to, to work with their general veterinarian and the owners for the dogs and cats. And my notes disappear. Next, I think we have uh, Jackson's owners, Kate and Matt Tiley. Um, Jackson's story is sponsored by Zoetis, and I want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Settles. Maybe you can come up afterwards as well. Dr. Settles is the uh, uh, chair of the board of our ACVM Foundation, and she's brought her goats here, not to here, but up into the booth. But she's uh, been very uh, involved in the ACVM, and thank you to Zoetis. So without further ado, Let's talk about Jackson. What's Jackson's favorite color? Jackson's favorite color is red. Uh, and, uh, and my favorite color is red. Too. I'm Matt. And I'm Kate. And Jackson was our dog. We lost Jackson nine days ago, so it's been pretty recent. We did not lose him to cancer. He was diagnosed with cancer 26 months ago. Really, like the best two years of his life were with cancer. I will be honest in that he was a difficult puppy. He liked to eat everything. He ate furniture, remote control, cell phones, money out of your wallet, seat belts, anything he could get his mouth on. Did he, he eat a Coke can? He did. Yeah. He did. Somebody else was watching him at the time and had left him alone in the car with a Coke can and came back and there was no Coke can in just a Jackson. So he was good at chewing things up, but he is definitely mischievous. 
Jackson's quality of life was great. Jackson was Jackson. He loved to chase a ball. He loved to go swimming. He loved to be with you just hanging out. You know, he, he just was a dog that just liked being present. Jackson started to have some mobility issues with his back legs and they were just a little bit wobbly and some people had suggested maybe he had arthritis. And I made an appointment with his regular vet, Dr. Siobhan Cantrell, and took him in to see what was going on with his back legs. She did x-rays and found that he had a partially torn ACL in both his left leg and his right leg. And their practice in doing x-rays is that they do a rectal exam before the x-rays. And when she did the rectal exam, she felt a very small bump or lump on his anal gland. So Dr. Cantrell had called me that evening and said, you know, bad news, I found a lump. And based on the lump, it does seem like it's something we need to check out. And right away, she referred me to Dr. Chelsea Tripp at Animal Medical Center. Jackson was initially diagnosed with a tumor in his anal sac. So he was taken in for evaluation to his regular veterinarian. Uh, they palpated a mass effect for him uh, in the region of his anal sac and ultimately uh, referred him for further diagnostics. He came to us uh, and needed what we call staging, where we have to understand, has the cancer spread at the time uh, of diagnosis? We performed an ultrasound for him of his abdomen and found that he had multiple multiple lymph nodes in the region uh, that drains the back end of the dog called the sublumbar lymph nodes. And so he had a primary anal sac tumor as well as this spread of lymph nodes into his abdomen. It looked grim. It was a type of cancer that was difficult to treat, that dogs didn't generally have good survival rates with any kind of treatment. And, you know, it was it was pretty discouraging right off the bat. Meeting with Dr. Tripp really changed that for me from the get-go and through his entire treatment, she was always very optimistic. She always had a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan to that. He needed surgery to have the primary tumor removed from his perineum, and then we had to go into the abdomen and actually take out the lymph nodes as well. So he had a two surgical approach. Unfortunately, there was a lymph node that was really far back and difficult for us to get out. It was actually inside the pelvis, kind of in that one spot between the two approaches where you can't reach it. So after surgery, we elected to treat him with some chemotherapy. And given that the chemotherapy has not been well worked out for this disease, a recent abstract was presented at our national conference that suggested that Palladia, a new drug that's come out on the market by Zoetis, actually has efficacy against anal sac adenocarcinoma and gross disease patients as well as patients that have had surgery. So we talked about it and decided to go forward with Palladia for Jackson. He handled it really well. He was able to have the drug with really no concerns. He completed about a six-month trial uh, of trying to maintain. We actually caused shrinkage of the lymph node that was present uh, within his pelvis and maintained good control of his primary tumor site as well as the other lymphatics in the region. He had a good quality of life with no concerns. I would say the last two years of Jackson's life were the best. You, you start looking around and you're like, this dog doesn't behave like he's sick at all. He has no side effects from the chemo. He's completely over surgery, like he's, he's just Jackson. You know, through all of this, he was 10 years old, 11 years old. So he wasn't necessarily the most active, energetic puppy, but like he behaved like a 10 or 11 year old dog and not like a sick dog in any way that you could point at. I feel so good about the treatments that we did for Jackson. I mean, Jackson had a team and they took very good care of him and everything was worth having that extra time with Jackson. Jackson was a really special guy. I think he's the poster child of handling chemotherapy. And people are scared about giving chemotherapy to their dogs. They say, wow, I've seen what my mom went through, or I've seen what my sister has gone through. In dogs and cats, we really try to maintain their quality of life as best as possible. And I actually challenge many of my clients to go out in the lobby and, and pick out the dogs that are on chemotherapy, because I don't think you can tell. They really have very good quality of life, and we want them to have as many good days as possible. And Jackson did. What could Jackson tell to other pet owners? 
It's, hey, yeah, so, okay, so your dog was just diagnosed with cancer. Doesn't mean your dog doesn't have good years, plural, left in him or in her. It doesn't mean that we're done here. There's a tremendous optimism there. I found it really important to share Jackson's story with people and to share that there's hope and to share that there's options and to share that chemotherapy can be a really pretty amazing thing. It's important for us to tell Jackson's story because he is and always will be a survivor to us. That, I really thank you both for coming up here and, and telling his story. That was just amazing. That is what Animal Survivor is all about. And before, I would like you guys, if you want to, to come up and talk. You know, they mentioned the team, their primary veterinarian, found doing a, a routine physical, but, a, you know, the rectal exam, a cancer really early on, or OB's parents, you know, saw. You guys found something really early on. That's, we're all working together. That's why we like our pets, particularly when they're older, to come into the vet every year. And for you folks that are petting them, notice when they're losing weight, anything lumps or bumps. The key of that, of that and referring to an oncologist like Dr. Tripp, is to do it sooner rather than later. And, and the prognosis can be so much better and the amount of suffering really limited. And, in, and we try not to talk much about costs because pets are priceless to us. But if we find out the diagnosis sooner rather than later, I really believe the costs are, are directed to exactly what it is and can be less in the long run. So do you want to folks want to come up and talk a little bit? Dr. Tripp, do you want to come up as well? And you got me crying. <laughs> We uh, did a, a, a transition to a, a little bit lesser aggressive protocol uh, for him for kind of more of a maintenance type strategy. Um, he did take a break at one point and then I felt like the lymph node was getting a little bigger and wanted to make sure he could uh, continue to defecate past it and uh, so we maintained him on what's called metronomic chemotherapy after that. Uh, but it was really, really interesting and, uh, to work with a new drug that had come out on the market. We didn't necessarily have a lot of experience with it and to actually get to see visible results for him. And so, uh, and he tolerated it beautifully. Uh, so uh, being able to utilize that information has really helped me to be able to prescribe it for other dogs as well. But his quality of life was excellent on it. His quality of life really, I mean, honestly, the last two years of his life were his best. Um, he was the same dog. He had some up and downs during treatment, but Dr. Tripp was always willing to adjust it, switch him around, switch the medications. Um, the one thing he did have with chemo is he had a little hair loss. And, you know, and Dr. Tripp even said, you know, patients aren't usually on chemo this long, you know. So, you know, you, you get out a year and a half, two years into chemotherapy, and they're just isn't a lot of study into what actually happens because usually dogs don't live that long. And yeah. so um, we saw some interesting hair. Yeah. 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 And it grew back <laughs> except for on his back. So he had this kind of crazy reverse mohawk, but you know, <laughs> it was cool. Yeah. We liked it. <laughs> it was great to have him. Yeah. It's really funny when uh, the hair tends to grow back, it tends to grow back a little softer and thinner, and it's almost like their puppy coat again. So I've actually had clients go, can you put him back on chemotherapy? Because I, <laughs> I really like the, the way his coat felt. And I was like, no, we're not going to do that. But he had the softest coat, when, uh, w w even though it was falling out. He was just extremely soft so and snuggly. How did you lose him? Uh, we lost him to kidney failure. So uh, the end of January, he started throwing up. We took him in because we were concerned it was related to the cancer and his numbers were just, his kidney numbers were bad. Um, and we had him for about a month trying to get him to rebound and he just, he wasn't rebounding. Um, but we lost him just short of 12 years. So he was diagnosed with cancer when he was nine and we got him to 12, so. There's a question in the back. 
it's actually an oral chemotherapy in, uh, agent. And uh, Palladia and uh, another drug in that same family are actually the first two uh, veterinary approved chemotherapeutics we have now. And uh, they become part of a family of drugs called the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And uh, they were re released on the market for mast cell tumors in dogs. And they cross react with a variety of receptors that we're finding probably other cancers have as well. And anal sac adenocarcinoma is one of them. So you'll be seeing these drugs uh, talked about more in abstracts, in literature, uh, in uh, use of a variety of cancer treatments. So they're up and coming, the newest drugs for us to be able to use in our armamentarium. Do you think the price will come down if they become more common? Uh, the price is actually not that bad, to be honest, right now with those two drugs. They've uh, priced them very nicely uh, in terms of comparison of traditional chemotherapy. Uh, you guys could probably Our speak to what... Our costs were under $100 a month on the chemo, and it varied depending on what chemo we were on at the time, but his maintenance costs were actually pretty reasonable. And, you know, treating a dog with cancer for 26 months, you're going to have a lot of costs. He had two surgeries. He had a lot of appointments. He was on a lot of different medications. But at the end, I think, I mean, I think the chemo he was on when he passed away was $80 a month. Metronomics is definitely, I would say, a little cheaper than, than the Palladia costs. Um, uh, probably for him, I would say dose-wise, he's probably about $300 a month for Palladia for him. So still not what I think our perception is of thousands and thousands <coughs> of dollars per month. Uh, it's really actually budgetable. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing then about, about an oral chemo is that it was really very easy for us because it's just okay, well, he takes a pill every day or every other day, and he was a pretty good pill taker, but there's no, you know, well, we have to go into the vet twice a week for IV drugs or none of that. It was just like, okay, well, so he has to take a pill, and he was already on a couple of different medications to try to keep his mobility up, so it's, okay, well, there's one more pill three, four times a week, which is really, I mean, it's really easy yeah. and, and has really no impact on his life or our lives other than remembering which day of the week you have to give what pill, <laughs> which we were mostly pretty good at. Did you begin with traditional chemo and then segue to metronomic chemo, or was it metronomic all the way? We, uh, Palladia was our, our traditional chemo. When we discussed the chemotherapies and the options that were available and the literature that was available, uh, there's still not great numbers or knowledge about which drugs should be selected first. And we talked about carboplatin, we talked about doxorubicin, we talked about oral drugs, and I think the oral really fit with their family and their lifestyle, and they wanted to have an option of treating him, but not necessarily as many visits. So um, I think the Palladia was a very good balance for that. Uh, and it worked beautifully. But you didn't start with the metronomics. No, we did Palladia first because it's a little bit stronger uh, in comparison to metronomics and then used the metronomics kind of to maintain what we'd achieved with the Palladia. Thank you guys very mm, much. Thank you. Thank you. you guys are very good questions out there as well. And you can see that the oncology doctor trip worked very carefully with the owners to de de to look at the t type of tumor, what was latest and greatest out there, and metronomics was actually discussed yesterday. Um, and that's what the forum is all about, but to decide what was best for the pet and the owners. Then I always like to put in a little point here is that referral to a specialist may not involve anything more than a consultation with the specialist as to what to the disease process could be, what could we do, what are the options. There are times that owners, and pretends it's a cancer or the owner's finances or owner's wishes don't want to pursue cancer chemotherapy or radiation, but they get the advice of the oncologist, and the oncologist will also work with end-of-life decisions. So then what, what am I going to look for? And what are some palliative treatments we can do? And again, this is always um, with the family veterinarian, so that extra advice is hugely important. We have two more animal survivors, and I'm excited to introduce Team Gomez, and we will see Lucy's story now. I'm Lori, this is Manny, this is our Jack Russell terrorist, Lucy. <laughs> I got Lucy in March 
about 10 years ago. She um, loves to play, loves to squeak. Well, well she loves toys. toys, squeaky toys. I mean, she, she just cannot get enough of them. I just happen to like the name Lucy because of the Lucille ball. And he wanted to come home and say, Lucy, I'm home. <laughs> How many times have you done that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We were out of town and I get this phone call from my mom and she said, something's not right. She's not playing, she's not eating, and she's not Lucy. She had been fine the day before, so I said, well, we'll be home in a few minutes or a few hours. You know, it's, it's not a big deal, it's probably just a tummy ache. We go to pick her up and her lymph nodes were just huge in her neck. And we we're like, okay, <laughs> this is not right. So we saw Lucy the first time in November of 2011, and she went to her veterinarian first, who did some basic blood work, looking for some infectious diseases, found that she had a fever at that time, and felt with the information that they had that they needed a little more workup done at a specialty center, so she was sent to us to work up those problems. We ended up doing some imaging exams, some more blood work, lab work, and basically we're not able to find a reason from the initial tests that we did for why the lymph nodes were big and why her white cell count was low. We ended up taking a sample of her bone marrow to look at the white cells and we discovered that she had an immune mediated problem which causes destruction of the early precursors of those white blood cells. It's called an immune mediated neutropenia. So she was treated for that um, and just before we had got the diagnosis back for the bone marrow aspirate, she also developed a polyarthritis, or so bad inflammatory response of multiple joints. So she had many different conditions going on at that same time. Well, we were devastated. I mean, here we had this little wild child that we lived with, and she was dying. I mean, she wasn't eating, she was vomiting, she just was not, she wasn't really responding, and we thought for sure we were gonna lose her. So we start a, a drug called prednisone. Along with that drug, we start another immunosuppressant drug, which takes a little bit longer to start working. So that by the time the side effects of the prednisone have really kicked in, we've got another drug on board. She had developed diabetes and pancreatitis and came in again a few months later, very sick from complicated diabetes. So we were not able to continue those medications because they make those, that disease worse. The diabetes becomes worse on steroids. She's had lots of treatments. <laughs> She's been hospitalized many times over the last year and a half. During that hospitalized stay, she also developed another immune-mediated problem with her skin. And so we biopsied her skin at that time and it came back suggestive of a skin disorder related to the immune system. So now we have three different immune-mediated problems in one patient and needed to put her on a different medication that hopefully would not make her diabetes or pancreatitis worse. She's had pancreatitis twice, I think. She's had diabetic ketoacidosis a couple of times. She's had liver issues. We started her on a different drug called cyclosporin, and she did fantastic on that. All of her symptoms of all of her diseases went away. Her diabetes was well controlled on that drug for about five months. And then she came in at the end of last year in December um, vomiting and not feeling well again. So we sent a biopsy of her liver out and that came back suggestive of a toxicity. So we had to stop the cyclosporin. All of her other diseases had been well controlled at that time, the immune mediated conditions that she had. So I felt comfortable stopping that medication. And when we did, her liver disease resolved and she was feeling great for another couple of months until her next problem developed, which we found was an obstruction of her common bile duct. So she had surgery to remove her gallbladder, place a stent to be able to allow bile to drain into the small intestine. Since then, she's been doing fantastic. She's recovered very well. She is blind. She has cataracts from her diabetes. And so when you look at her, um, she doesn't react to her surroundings like a normal dog would because she can't see very well. So a lot of that can kind of complicate our interpretation. But really what it comes down to is how willing she is to play with her toys. That has been a very big indicator to us about how well or not well she's feeling. And really that's a big indicator for us that she's feeling well if she's squeaking on her toys. We made a conscious decision to try and keep her as independent as possible. We just let her find her own way. She's happy. She wakes up every morning squeaking her toy. She comes in the bedroom with her toy in her mouth. Let's get up, let's get going. She's a great quality of life.
I will have to say one of the, the challenges as small animal internal medicine specialists like myself and Dr. Kelly McCord is you could hear that some of those diseases our generalists, our private practitioners do treat, but when it gets to be so many different diseases and the animals are reacting to the drugs, complicated diabetes, complicated immune mediated disease, that's when the internist, hopefully we can sort it all out and try, and it's sometimes it's just trying things, but that's why a team like Team Gomez um, with the family veterinary really can work to help put it all together. So do you folks want to come up and, and, sh and show Lucy and bring her toy? And it's Dr. Kelly McCord. Is he here? Do you want to come up, Dr. McCord? Dr. McCord is an internist down at Summit uh, Veterinary Referral Center down in Tacoma. Um, we uh, even know I actually work in Tacoma and, and I live in Tacoma and work up at North here. It, it's really hard for owners to travel all those distances. We're, so we're lucky to have some specialty practices down in the Tacoma area. Do you have any questions for these folks? I think we're all very scared of cameras and talking yeah. in front of people. <laughs> so this is, a <laughs> this is a good combination here. <laughs> <laughs> she is just something for her kidneys. What is she on? An alopril. She's on an alopril. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then, of course, um, her, her insulin for her diabetes twice a day. But and all her immune-mediated diseases seem to be at check at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our hope is with many of the immune system disorders, if we can get that problem under control with medications, we always try to taper off of those medications very slowly to try to retrain the immune system not to attack those tissues. And many times we can get them off. And luckily, with all of the issues that she's had, we've been able to keep her off of those medications. She's been doing really well. <laughs> she says, I haven't seen Hi, Dr. baby. Hi, sweet peas. Hello. I know I that missed voice. You. Yeah. Yes, they can be. Yep. Hers were not. Hers were not. She sees an ophthalmologist. Hers were not operable. So we tried. It depends on how much inflammation and other issues are going on in the eyes there. So, I mean, globes can be removed. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but it also depends on all the other issues that they have. Um, big surgeries like that can really throw off certain diseases, too, depending on their status at that time, including diabetes. So we have to be very careful with that. <laughs> well, and actually her cataracts were kind of the f one of the first thing, and we took her to an ophthalmologist right away when she just had one, and I think it was the left eye, and she just said she's not operable. It wasn't until later when all the immune-mediated stuff started that she said, aha, uh -huh, we know why she has the cataracts now. So we did try. We didn't really want to have a blind dog, but she's just fine. She gets along great. <laughs> doesn't like to be held. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you. You know, I, I had forgotten that Lucy was blind, and if you saw her walking around the room here, you wouldn't know. Um, they, they learn, as long as you don't, we joke, change the furniture around or let them outside um, by themselves. They do, Actually, they, they yeah. She's, they, they learn things you, 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 really, you really wouldn't know, so they do really well without, well without their vision. So thank you very much, Team Gomez, for bringing Lucy in. And last but not least, we're going to introduce Q to you with our next video. A little different. Okay, okay. I love you too. Why don't you bite my stick? I knew you were going to bite me. He's so curious. He is what's called a right brain extrovert, meaning that he's yeah, very curious. Hi, this is my baby, my big angel. This is Q. All the foals born at Rosebud Ranch are named alphabetically and chronologically. So it was a Q year, and no one could agree on a name, a Q name. Quasimodo, everyone was coming up with dozens of names, and nobody could agree on anything. So we just named him the letter Q. <laughs> this is our little baby that we almost lost. We didn't know he was sick for a long time. He was extremely lethargic, I meaning he just wasn't as rambunctious by the time he was six months old. He was quiet. We thought it was our brilliant training, you know, and conditioning that he was so well behaved, but he was actually sick. 
then one day it erupted and he spiked 104 fever, which is absolutely catastrophic for all living creatures, but especially a horse. Normal temperature is about 99 or 100. So, and, then, and then he was sick, he wouldn't eat. And that's of course the number one symptom with a horse, is if they don't eat, you've got a problem. I knew this little boy had a bad infection. I didn't know what it was, he was sick. So I went and found Northwest Equine. I found uh, Dr. Rothschild. I knew she was the top of the line internal expert, and that's what I needed. At the time, when I looked at him, his blood work, he had signs of infection, like a high white cell count. But one interesting finding was that he had a very low protein. And at his age, eating a great diet like he does here, especially having access to all this pasture, that was kind of very unusual. We did some ultrasound exams of his chest and his abdomen to try and find what kind of infection could be involved here. After a series of exams, we found a disease that's called proliferative enteropathy, and it's called by Lasonia intracellularis. Lasonia is a disease that we typically see in pigs, but we rarely see it in horses, and I had never seen a case in the Seattle area. I had seen others in other states or other parts of the state. Over the course of the week that we were doing our diagnostics, his protein started to drop very quickly and he started to have edema swelling under his jaw and down to his chest. And so we decided not to wait for all the tests to come back to confirm Lasonia and just go ahead and treat him because we were afraid he was going to die or not make it. So we treated him, we began a, a regimen of treatment, and I'll never forget the summer day when she took me up on the porch on the deck and showed me what we had to do. Breaking open vials and grinding meds together and then putting them in a syringe for seven days a week, three times a day, sometimes four times a day. We were terrified. You know, I thought, I can't, I can't do this. And then she said, well, you can do it. The question is, will the baby let you treat him? That's when they die, because they won't take their medicine. Intuitively, we knew that he knew we were helping him. He never once shied from us. He let us treat him, and then he started to recover. And we continued treatment for a total of six weeks, because this disease can recur if you stop too soon. And now here he is, he's six inches taller, his coat is really silky, and he went back to being as he should have been. Sometimes we have patients that you can tell they really want to live. And Q was one of those guys, like he never gave up, even though his blood work was quite severe and his disease was quite advanced, he just wanted to get better and he helped with every step of the way. You do what you have to do. You do what you have to do. Your goal is to heal the baby, heal the horse. And so whatever we had to do, we were going to do. And we did, as a team. And I, you know, I look at him, and I just really just wish every horse on the planet had that kind of love and care. I want to introduce and have come up, if you guys like, Julie Blacklow, um, Q's trainer, and Dr. Chantal Rothschild, uh, the large animal internist that helped diagnose. And tell a little bit more about this. It's an unusual disease, but what a beautiful animal. Yeah. And a little bit about his breed as well, Rocky Mountain. Yes, yeah. um, they are uh, uh, an endurance horse. They're called gated horses. I don't know if you all know anything about horses, but they have a walk, trot, canter, and gallop, but also a fifth gate, which is called the champagne gate where you just glide in the saddle. It's for older people like me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's what, what and they, ha they can go 50 miles a day, 100 miles a day, uh, if we need them to. We don't ride that hard. But uh, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> remembering. Yeah, so um, this disease, we don't see it very often around here, but um, it, it does happen. It's very common in pigs, and it's a bacteria that we believe horses eat the feces of a, another animal that had it, usually 
Um, originally we thought it must have been a pig, but now they're finding that some wild animals can carry it and they'll defecate it. Horses will graze in that area and they acquire the bacteria goes in their intestine and starts to grow inside the cells of the intestine. And then the horse cannot absorb the protein that he eats and it also leaks out protein into the fecal matter. So very quickly the protein levels drop and they start feeling very lethargic. They don't grow as well. They don't look healthy and they start getting swelling because protein is important to keep the fluid in the blood vessels and they don't have that. And um, in Q's case, in two days, his protein dropped very significantly and um, he was close to, maybe if we had waited three, four days, he probably wouldn't have made it. And like Julie said, he, when I saw him, he was such a nice boy and so cuddly and putting his head in me. He wasn't active like he was in the video. And I was like, this, this is not normal for a young horse. And she's like, well, but we've trained him. We've, <laughs> we've spent hours working on him. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, there's something really wrong. And she was a, f a little offended. And I'm I like, I was <laughs> not. Well, maybe. So, and then once he got better on the antibiotics, she kept calling me, like, oh, we can't catch him. Or now he, <laughs> yeah. he tries to bite us. And now this. And I'm like, yay. <laughs> like, that's what we want, you it's know. And, and now he's normal. And he, he was small at the time. Like, Julie thought he was the right size and I could tell by all his blood work and how he was unhealthy I was like this horse should have been much taller and bigger and then since we did treat him <laughs> he's grown and now he's bigger than a thoroughbred which in this breed they're supposed to be shorter and so um, yeah now we have a, a, a giant. giant yeah I, I do want to say also uh, just in terms of how we found Dr. Rothschild Q was, uh, I, when we knew he was sick, we brought in the vets that we were currently using at the ranch. And I have to say, we were using one of the top, one of the top equine vets in, in the state. That said, um, I was not satisfied with what his diagnosis was. The protein level was al already low, but he didn't make a big deal about it. And he said, oh, he'll be fine, don't worry. At that moment, um, I knew, I have a 30-year experience as an investigative journalist before I got into horses, so I wasn't accepting that diagnosis. I knew this, th I knew this horse, and I knew he was sick, and he wasn't getting better, so I had to basically offend the vet who first diagnosed him and not accept what he said. Um, he was not at all happy about that. Um, I didn't care. I needed to find uh, an internal medicine specialist who could go further with him because I was determined to do everything, as everyone here has so wonderfully stated, and all of you I know agree, everything you can possibly do for the life of your animal. And that's what I did, and I didn't care. I was used to offending people anyway, so <laughs> it, it didn't really bother me at all. So, yes. Um, not really. It was pretty straightforward. Um, we, the first day I saw him, because of his age, he was a little bit older than the typical age range we see for Lasonia, but I had seen many cases. I worked in Texas and also at WSU at the university. I was there for seven years and I had seen plenty of these. So it, it looked pretty obvious to me. It's just a little bit hard to do the diagnostics because it's one of those where serology will be positive but then that could mean he was just exposed it doesn't mean it's a real positive we did a PCR test on his feces but he had been placed on antibiotics by the previous veterinarian and so PCRs which is a test that's trying to detect DNA of the bacteria in the fecal matter will often be negative when they've been on antibiotics so just getting to a diagnosis so that the owner can be convinced can be a little bit hard and but he deteriorated so quickly that I told Julie and this was my first encounter with a client and you know horse people are, are a little picky about their vets <laughs> and so I just sat her down and said you know we could spend two three weeks and a lot of money to get this diagnosis 
And my recommendation is just trust me and, and treat this animal this way because this treatment only works for Lasonia and Rhodococcus. There's nothing else in horses that is going to get better. Mm -hmm. So if it is, in just a few days, he's going to respond positively. And that will save you a lot of money and, and maybe his life. So I said, you either take it or leave it, you know, <laughs> because the positive tests that are going to help you be sure are going to take too long and he's not going to make it. And Julie just looked at me and she said, okay, let's do it. And we treated him and in three days his protein started coming up and everything started to go well. But um, one thing that I would like to say after listening to all these beautiful stories is that this is so wonderful to hear successful stories because as an internal medicine specialist, sometimes not all of them are this way. You know, we do put down a lot of animals or we have a lot of diagnoses that are cancers that are too advanced or some of these conditions. Like Q, if I had seen him four or five days later, maybe I wouldn't have been able to help him. And some days we go home, I was talking to another internal medicine yesterday and we couldn't save three patients that day. And we feel like, what are we doing? You know, I feel so crappy today. And so when we come here and we listen to all these positive ones, then it reminds us this is why we do it. We lose lots, they're not all this successful, but stories like you and everybody else's keeps us, the doctors, inspired to keep working because some days it is a little tough. And Q was so, we, we said in the video, he helped us help him. He just knew, I don't know, you, well you all know, you know the animals know, and he knew, and he wanted to live, and just a, a, coincidentally, a couple of days ago, oh, Q, he ate a piece of tape um, <laughs> off of a fence post. Uh, and so we had to, I had to give him some oral mineral oil. Um, I called Chantel immediately. I said, uh, and she said, uh, well, we can't have anything happen to him before this. So <laughs> we, we, uh, she said, fill as many vials as you can with mineral oil syringes and get as much mineral oil in him as you can and some banamine. So I went over, we put him in the cross ties and I had someone hold him and he went, because he remembered. He, you know, every time we had six, t five times a day, we're doing this to him for six weeks. So he just went, Okay, and he opened his mouth and, and let us stroke his throat and, you know, took it. So the tape came out, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. No, no, I thought it was our brilliant training, as I said. <laughs> no, in, in fact, I've talked to several equine vets who who'd never heard of it either. So it's pretty rare. I have a theory how he got it. Um, he went in at four months old to be, he had a hernia, and uh, we, we had him gelded at the same time. So we did a double surgery on him. He was never the same when he came back from surgery. I think he got it, not at their place. Um, I think he got it in hospital, what happens in humans with MRSA and all the stuff that you hear about. I think he got an infection uh, that way. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. And um, no other foal, I've, uh, we've gone through, I had 100 foals over the last 20 years at the ranch and we've never seen anything like this. So sometimes when you hear hoofbeats think horses not zebras, you know, and that was the most obvious thing to me that I could uh, historically look back and, and well, put together. The frame, though, between the surgery where he went in and when you got sick. Pretty, now that I, you know, hindsight, right? Yeah. Uh, now that I think about it, he came back and a month later he was, he was so calm and nice <laughs> and quiet. And I said, oh, we're such good trainers, you know, and he was sick. But he, it didn't erupt it. It was, it was a pathogen that was living in his intestines until finally he spikes a fever and not, doesn't eat. Traditionally, Lasonia cases from when the foals are infected until they get to the point that the protein is so low that they get sick, it can be three to six months. Mm -hmm. So it's a chronic kind of disease. It's not very quick. So they noticed a month after. It's impossible to know how he acquired it because in other farms there's never been pigs or anyone close to pigs. And so that's why now they're starting to do research on wild animals that come around those farms. And that may be something too that could have happened. But he was like that, very calm and quiet and very friendly for about three months or so before he started having fevers and getting the swelling and getting sick. 
And we have coyotes that live on the property, a bobcat, and elk. So there is, there are other creatures, critters there. One more question. No, not, not with that. Yeah, usually not in these cases because these are young. They're foals. They're not adult horses. We don't see as much laminitis as a complication in babies. In Q's case, he was already much older um, than most foals. Most foals are diagnosed by the time they're six, seven months old, and he was nearly a yearling. So that was the only part of the history that didn't quite match the typical presentation. But they, because they're tiny, skinny, and they're um, on only antibiotics, we don't usually see laminitis as a problem. But you know, it's a horse, and so <laughs> colic and laminitis can always yeah. happen. Um, he's 16-1 now at the Withers, mm -hmm. wow. so he's enormous, yeah. Thank you very Thanks. much, Thank wonderful you. story, gosh. Thank you both very much. And I just want to comment on something that Julie said is I mentioned several times the partnership of the family veterinarian and the specialist. Um, and most, most of, we really encourage veterinarians to refer the cases, but there are times that owners really want that referral. And so we encourage owners like Julie to ask their veterinarian for a referral. But you can, and most specialists will take veterans refer, um, owners referring on their own. And at our website, acvm.org, beautiful new website, we have a place where you can find a specialist in your local area. And then oftentimes we will contact the general veterinarian because we need to work for follow-up in the future with them. But again, it is all about what's best for the pet. And sometimes we as specialists know there's some weird little creek thing that people hadn't even have thought of. And as Dr. Rothschild mentions, we do see the sickest patients and we do really care. I, I really appreciate that about them. They become part of our family as well. And sometimes we, we can't cure everything, but the second um, finding out about what the disease could be gives owners a lot of peace of mind as well. Even just knowing that there isn't much that could be done or palliative. Um, I think we we just want to try the best that we can, but sometimes it's even harder for us. So I really want to thank our sponsors today. It was really interesting to hear how about Healthy Paws Pet Insurance. Pet insurance has come real important part of, of our job and in just general health care. Zoetis with Palladium new drugs that we're talking about and, and research are working on that are here at this meeting and Hills Pet Nutrition, a huge support of the ACVIM and their wonderful line of therapeutic pet foods. I do want to thank um, the ACVM Communications and Marketing Committee and our giving branch, the ACVIM Foundation, acvmfoundation.org, where, where people can really donate in name of their veterinarian specialist. I've done that with a specialist helped me years ago and then their pet to, to help honor their pets to, to help future disease. And I encourage you uh, to help solve future disease. And I encourage you folks to come up afterwards and ask questions and meet these lovely pets. Thanks, Obi and uh, um, uh, Lucy. Lucy and um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Jackson, that Jackson, Baxter, Baxter and really. Thank you to Q that isn't here, the lovely horse, and to Jackson and, and you folks. Wonderful story, and thank you all very much for coming.